their parents, guardians, faculty, staff, alumni, the graduating classes of uh, 2020 and 2021, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant morning to all of us. It is my honor and privilege to be requested to deliver a parting message to the graduates of 2020 and 2021. As uh, many of us know, UP Mindanao was established some 26 years ago, early in my term as UP president. And now seeing how much UP Mindanao has progressed, I am naturally very proud and happy with my association with its uh, founding. All these years I have meant to, but somehow I have not gotten around to publicly recognizing and thanking the many generous men and women who had important roles in the establishment of UP Mindanao, who unfortunately remain anonymous and not very much appreciated. So this morning, I hope you won't mind if I take this unique opportunity to publicly recognize and thank these generous men and women. First, if there are any people or group of people to whom we owe the establishment of UP Mindanao, these are Sebastian Ang Yongto and his partner in crime, Jan Gaisano, and the many loyal alumni in the Davao City chapter. I remember among them, uh, Sid Ungab, uh, Aida Reyes, uh, Bobby Ramos, uh, Danny Gillian, uh, Doris and Rico Villarreal, uh, Sunny Puyod, and I'm sure there were many, many others. This uh, group of uh, uh, loyal alumni were very assiduous in following up in Malacanang and going after congressmen and senators and uh, urging on the administrations of uh, UP uh, to make good on UP Mindanao. The next person whom I would like to call attention to is the former, was the former DN, DENR Secretary, uh, Victor Ramos. Secretary Victor Ramos, an alumnus of uh, MASCOM in Diliman. Among state colleges and universities, UP Mindanao is very fortunate to have, to have as many as three land grants. I don't know of any other SUC similarly endowed by government. In addition to the main campus in Bago Shiro, our forestry alumni under the direction of Victor Ramos set aside a three a 5,000 hectare reservation in Marilog, in the Bukidnon Dabao border, and a 3,000 hectare property in the town of Laak in Compostela Valley. So, Victor Ramos, 
drafted the necessary presidential proclamations to grant these properties to UP Mindanao. And uh, Secretary Ramos made sure that FBR signed those proclamations before our terms were over. In the case of the 204 hectare property in Bago Shiro, we can thank the late Bureau of Land Industry Director uh, Nerius Roperos, a graduate of UPLB, who was only too happy to carve out the 200 hectares out of the Bago Zero Experiment Station for UP Mindanao. The Lahak Town uh, Reservation of 3,000 hectares had a uh, story behind it. The young mayor of Lahak Town during that time, whose name escapes me, was only too happy to recommend to President Ramos that the forest in the back of their town be awarded to UP rather than to laggers. But the mayor had one simple request to UP, which was to establish a high school for that town, which we did. So the first thing we did was to uh, deploy four very courageous coeds, graduates of UP Visayas, under the tutelage of Professor Ruben Gamala, to constitute the first faculty of the Laak Town uh, UP High School. High School. Uh, UP contributed uh, cement, steel bars, GI roofing while the, the LGU contributed lumber, sand, and gravel, and labor to construct the Laak High School buildings. And I made sure that in the following fiscal years, the Laak High School was incorporated in the public school system, courtesy of uh, then DepEd Secretary Brother Andrew uh, Gonzalez. It is only proper uh, that we named the boys' dormitory after Elias Lopez. In fact, I should have mentioned Elias Lopez first, because after all, Elias Lopez has the honor of filing the bill which established UP uh, Mindanao. Uh, but in fairness, actually, the late Congressman Prospero Nograles Sr. filed a similar bill in the previous Congress, <coughs> which, however, lapsed. lapsed. <coughs> uh, Elias, Gonzal uh, Elias Lopez is a very forceful, colorful personality. And I have uh, the fortune of working with him in steering the UP Mindanao bill to Congress. And I have two interesting stories to share about the late Congressman Elias Lopez. Many are not aware that the smart lawyer that Elias Lopez was, he filed the UP Mindanao bill as a bill of local application. So in Congress, there are two types of bills, the national bills and the bills of local application, which hearings are not much attended. In those hearings for those local bills, the presence of the chairman, the proponent, and one or two congressmen witnesses are sufficient to establish a quorum. So among Sunny Scudero, who was chair of education in the lower house, uh, Elias Lopez, and uh, Simeon Datumano, uh, the UP Mindanao breezed through the hearings, just like that. <clears throat> so when I asked Elias Lopez 
what was his reason for filing UP Mindanao bill as a bill of local application? And this was his uh, smart reply. You know, Mr. President, the establishment of UP Mindanao is not very different from establishing another high school for Davao City. And therefore, UP Mindanao bill is of li little interest to the other congressmen. So that was his smart reply. Uh, I remember another interesting story about Elias Lopez in the Senate where I was uh, being grilled to justify UP Mindanao. The opposition senator Ernesto Maceda asked me point blank whether there were squatters who will be displaced in the Bago Shiro reservation. But before I can reply, Elias Lopez, who is a congressman and who has no business in the hearings, uh, uh, went to the Senate floor, grabbed a microphone, and very pompously declared that there, are, there were no squatters in the UP Mindanao Reservation. So while, in, while having lunch with him after, I chided Elias Lopez that we were not exactly truthful in the hearing because he and I knew that we were negotiating <coughs> and trying to relocate 64 squatter families. So I asked Elias Lopez, and again, he had this smart reply. You know, Emil, uh, a Filipino cannot be a squatter in his homeland. A Filipino cannot be a squatter in the Philippines. And by that logic, there are no squatters in the UP Mindanao Reservation. So that's, uh, those are the two stories I, I have about <coughs> Elias Lopez. In the narrative surrounding the establishment of UP Mindanao, there was an account which said that uh, I, as UP president, was summoned to Malacanan by President Ramos and was instructed to establish UP Mindanao. That narrative is not true. President Ramos was very proper in his dealings with the Board of Regents and respected our academic autonomy. Uh, President Ramos was aware of the drive of the alumni to create UP Mindanao, but he left it to the Board of Regents to do what is necessary. So there was no instruction from President Ramos. If ever I had any instruction, it really came from the full board. The full board of regents was unanimously in favor of UP Mindanao. And the regents did not need any prompting from the president. And at, maybe at this point, we should also remember who the regents were. Uh, led by Armand Pabella, the chair, and the two very influential members, namely Let Senator Leticia Ramos Shahani and uh, Sani Scudero III, who were chairs of the respective education committees in the houses of Congress. <laughs> there were others like Justice Carpio, Regent Oscar Alfonso, Nelia Gonzalez, National Scientist Paulo Campos, Professor Emerenciana Arceliana, uh, alumni regent Ed Spiritu, and the student regent, uh, Dennis uh, Kunanan. I will be remiss if I also don't uh, point out the contribution of uh, Professor Fortunato Boy de la Peña, the current Secretary of Science and Technology, because uh, Sec Boy, whom we fondly call, was 
my vice president for planning and development at that time. So, in fact, the point man in all the efforts to bring these things together rested on the shoulders of uh, Secretary Boy de la Peña, including the preparation of the campus plan where he enlisted the support of uh, landscape specialist Fernando Sanchez Jr., the former chancellor of uh, UP Los Baños. And finally, we must recall and appreciate the contributions of uh, the founding dean and chancellor, Roger Quino. Roger Quino was in the, uh, from the beginning, from the conceptualization and all the campaign to establish uh, UP Mindanao. It was only appropriate that a native of Mindanao became its first dean and chancellor because Roger Quino is a native of Surigao. And he came well prepared because Roger had a PhD in communications and development management from Michigan State University. And in the mid 70s, he was very, very uh, important in the training of the tens of thousands of rice technicians during the Masagana 99 years, as well as the installation of research management as a discipline at UPLB and the other state colleges and universities, and in Picard DOSD. And of course, the uh, faculty, the pioneering faculty of UP Mindanao, who were generously shared by UP Los Baños and UP Diliman for its sibling university. I recall among them from UP Los Baños, academician Eupemio Rasco, uh, my assistant then, uh, Tony Moran, uh, Leonardo Chua, Dulce Flores, uh, Edwin Protasio, uh, the uh, couple Bert and Carol uh, Santillana. And from Diliman, we were very fortunate to have Marcy Dance, uh, Tess uh, Gillian, my Kababayan, as well as uh, Aniceto Poblador and uh, Jose Garrido. So uh, UP Mindanao had a good start with that excellent set of pioneer faculty generously shared by both UP Diliman and UP Los Baños. Now let me proceed with my assignment this morning to share my ideas with the graduates of 2020 and 2021 on the theme transcending the pandemic, a resilient recovery towards the new normal. In the first place, uh, COVID-19 is a uh, Nobel experience uh, for us in the Philippines because we were fortunately spared by the two previous pandemics, uh, SARS-1 and uh, MERS-CoV, both of which are like COVID-19 zoonotic in origin. So those three diseases are uh, zoonotic diseases, meaning that the pathogens were uh, naturally uh, infect infecting livestock and wildlife, but some somehow these pathogens are able to jump to human beings. So the first that uh, 
first thing that the university could do among many others is to prepare and study carefully uh, those possible zoonotic pathogens that could very well uh, jump into human beings because for sure COVID-19 will not be the last of such zoonotic diseases. So recently, the College of Veterinary Medicine uh, 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 submitted to the Board of Regents and the Board of Regents approved the concept of a zoonotic diseases center in UPLB as our contribution to the continuing study and anticipation of such possible pandemics in the future. The pandemic is far from over, but at least for now, uh, in fairness to our government, national and local, the transmission rates of uh, COVID-19 have been moderated in the urban centers, in the NCR, Region 3, Region 4, where there are concentrations of populations and where the incidences are, are very high. However, there are new threats because there are now reports of mutations or new variants of COVID-19, some of which may be more contagious than the original pathogen. For example, the Delta variant, which originated from South Africa. I understand there's a Lambda variant and even a Theta variant from the Philippines. The good news is, uh, although the current vaccines available are slightly less effective in preventing transmission, all the vaccines so far have been still very effective in preventing uh, severe uh, infection, hospitalization, and uh, morbidity. Since the pandemic is far from over, it's very difficult to be uh, upbeat at this point. But I am a incredible optimist and I am sanguine that although things look very bad now, but like the previous pandemics, COVID-19 will too come to pass. With my little background in biology, I am certain that our immune systems will eventually reach an equilibrium with the pathogen. And there will be herd immunity in the population. And as always, the human race will go on. So it's not a matter of whether but when will the nations or populations attain herd immunity both from natural infection as well as by artificial inoculation or vaccination. In theory, a most expedient approach is to allow the contagion to grow to go through the population quickly to attain herd immunity and get it over with. However, this fatalistic but scientifically based course of action will come at a cost because if the contagion is left unchecked, the surge of patients will overwhelm the hospitals 
leading to mortalities, many of whom could be saved if appropriate and timely medical interventions are applied on them. So therefore, this uh, expedient of allowing the pathogen just to go through the population is not politically acceptable nor morally correct because there are so many deaths that will occur which we know we could prevent by vaccination. In this regard, Sweden, a very progressive country in Northern Europe, uh, uh, took this option of allowing uh, the, the uh, pathogen to go through their population. But in no time, there were so many deaths per million inhabitants, so Sweden was uh, forced to reconsider its, uh, its strategy. <clears throat> But again, fortunately, with the advances in uh, molecular biology and the uh, resolute action of some governments and uh, uh, big uh, pharma industry, there are now so many candidate vaccines which came about in 12 to 18 months instead of the decade-long time that most uh, vaccines in the past took before they were commercially available. So the race among nations now is how fast to accumulate or access sufficient vaccines to uh, inoculate at least 70% of their populations to attain herd immunity as quickly as possible. And so this is where we are in the whole world, including the, the Philippines. The developed economies who had uh, plenty of cash to spare and who had the foresight to make advances have now cornered the vaccines and the transmission rates and uh, uh, morbidities in those populations have gone down. In our case, our IATF assures us that by the end of 2021, we would have uh, accessed sufficient vaccines to uh, inoculate 70% of our population. Uh, however, at the rate we are going, it's quite doubtful if we will reach that ambition of herd immunity by the end of the year. So it's more likely by middle or next year, uh, by which time we should have obtained enough uh, vaccines. Therefore, in the meantime, the best that we can do is even those who have been vaccinated to keep wearing masks, avoiding crowds and washing hands adapting these sanitary measures to slow down the transmission to prevent that our national health service will be overwhelmed. Of course, this strategy of lockdowns is causing a lot of economic hardship to our people. Locking down factories mean less uh, jobs, less available goods and services. The lockdown of transport is uh, causing uh, our economy to come to a halt. And uh, we are now in a real recession for the first time after so many, many years. The challenge now that we are facing is how do we carefully calibrate the deployment of vaccines as they become available, particularly first for the seniors with comorbidities and the front line, frontliners, but also to those centers of populations where infections are highest, and which also are the locations where most of our productive enterprises are located. 
So it's a matter of now of how our government very skillfully calibrate the deployment of the vaccines. Of course, that's easier said than done. But if you really come to think of it, the quicker way of attaining herd immunity in the country is by opening the schools. The young people are not immune to COVID-19. They will also be infected. But uh, experiences all over the world show that young people, are, most of them are asymptomatic or the expression of the disease is mild. And uh, hospitalization and morbidities are, are very rare. So if we take that route, that means we have to prioritize the vaccination of uh, teachers and employees in the public school uh, system. So going back to the theme, transcending the pandemic, my previous uh, uh, comments uh, imply that in fact, it's inevitable that we will go past the pandemic Soon, sooner or later as we get more people vaccinated and as more people get naturally infected, uh, the, nat the population will attain herd immunity. So the challenge that comes is uh, how do we, do we as uh, individuals, especially you young graduates, our communities and our nation, prepare ourselves for the disruptions and aftershocks that come after the pandemic. In the first place, all of us should have come around the reality that the pandemic has really undoubtedly changed the way people live and work. These uh, disruptions and transformations are most evident in the, the number of people working at home. Most of our uh, people in the bureaucracy and in the offices are now working at home. And there's more <clears throat> virtual commerce or e-commerce. And in many of the developing countries, more automation and more robots. With the digital commerce and digital banking, there will be less need for brick and mortar stores and banks. And there will be more uh, consultations, uh, medical consultations by, by telephone and, uh, and video. However, these trends, in fact, had been going on for several years already in the developed economies. We are experiencing a little of that. What, but what the pandemic really did was to accelerate the rollout of these modes of conducting businesses and transactions. And so for the less developed economies like ourselves, the pandemic simply brought the future <clears throat> much earlier than expected, unfortunately, way before we are ready. So the question now is, what are those trends that will become major features of the economies and the work environments in the years to come? In a survey of uh, 18,000 business executives and managers in uh, 15 countries by McKinsey, the global consulting company, they came up with 10 very important trends in technology. Uh, 10 important trends that uh, would feature 
the workplace in the coming years. Unfortunately, uh, it will take a while to explain each of those, these 10 trends, but suffice to say that uh, we will project it in the screen and uh, leave it to our young graduates to figure out what those trends are. I think it is sufficient for them to uh, take note of the keywords uh, that in the next years to come, we have to worry about uh, the next generation of computing, the application of artificial intelligence, machine learning and robots, distributed infrastructure, uh, programming, connectivity, the biotech revolution, next level process automation and visualization, clean technologies, nanotechnologies, and the next generation of materials. I'm sorry it's going to be a very abbreviated one. I don't think we have time. But I think it suffice that uh, our graduates take note of those key words because uh, these are the trends that you graduates must uh, prepare for and try to master uh, not only for your own personal careers but part of your obligation as mga scholar para sa bayan because you are UP alumni. It goes without saying that our national capacity to compete and take our rightful place among nations will heavily depend on how well we master these uh, trends that are coming. And so you, our dear graduates of UP Mindanao of 2020 and 2021, you represent the cream of the crop of our next generation. It is your obligation to comprehend, to acquire and master these technologies to advance our national purpose, purposes. And better yet, for some of you who are so inclined, you should consider engaging in research and the generation of these new technologies to enhance our national competitiveness. Again, I'm sorry to cramp all of this, but uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that in the new normal, you must be prepared, among other things, to operate remotely, to innovate <coughs> and adapt. But these new trends will affect occupations and professions in different ways. McKinsey again reports that in their estimate, 14% of the employees worldwide will have to be fully reskilled for these uh, global trends in technology. 14% must be fully reskilled. And about 40% of the workers must be partially reskilled. So what are these uh, uh, sets of skills that will be very important for our young people in the years to come? Again, Mac McKinsey has this uh, to tell us. There are four uh, skill sets necessary for individuals to thrive and be able to compete in this uh, new environment. Uh, number one is you must have digital skills to operate at a pace in a fully digital environment. Second, you have uh, cognitive skills, problem solving skills <coughs> to redesign and innovate in an increasingly autonomous environment. Thirdly, you must have social and emotional skills 
to ensure effective communication and collaboration and interpersonal skills to cultivate relationships <coughs> which used to be nurtured in person. And finally, adaptability and resilience. Your ability to manage time boundaries and mental wellness. So as I close, I let us acknowledge and thank the parents and guardians and faculty for their efforts in helping mold our young graduates for the real world ahead of him. And so to the graduates of 2020 and 2021, I must remind you that as alumni of UP, much more are expected of you to provide inspiration, direction, and leadership, not only in your places of work, but also in your respective communities and circles of family and friends. I trust that the university has inculcated in your young minds of your special obligation to excel in the disciplines and professions, but also serve as exemplars of selfless volunteers as pioneers in society simply because you are graduates of UP. The COVID-19 pandemic realistically won't be over and may take a year or two before economic and social activities settle down. And in most probability, COVID-19 will never go away, but simply stay around like a seasonal flu. But the new normal will be heavily influenced by the technological trends which I just uh, breezed through, which you, our graduates, need to prepare and master for our country's future. Mabuhay kayo, mabuhay tayong lahat. <laughs>